introduce Steve Moore, obviously a, a man who needs no introduction to this crowd. Editorial board member, senior economics writer with the Wall Street Journal, former head of the Club for Growth. Um, you see Steve constantly on Fox News where he comments regularly on economic and fiscal policy and politics, lectures across the country. He's heading to Palm Beach from here, heading across the state. Lectures on business, investments, um, the economy, the future of this great country. Uh, Steve has, as, as Glenn alluded to, um, you know, I, I have moved away a lot from print media. I read my local newspaper and I read the Wall Street Journal and virtually everything else I read is, uh, is online, just about. Uh, but the Wall Street Journal editorial page is some of the smartest, funniest, clever writing that there is, either online or in print. And Steve is responsible for more than most of that. Um, you know him. He's going to come forward and talk with us, give us a little post-election analysis. Please join me in welcoming Steve Moore. Good afternoon, folks. It is a pleasure to be here. Um, how many of you watch Fox News pretty regularly? Um, what, what would we do without Fox News? Uh, 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 the ratings are off the charts, by the way. Uh, the re most recent ratings just came out uh, two weeks ago, uh, and now Fox News has a bigger audience at night than CNBC, CNN, and MSNBC combined. So that's uh, pretty exciting. And I have to tell you, I, I've been doing Greta Zussman's show quite a bit. I always say she's perfect for Fox, right, because she's fair, balanced, and blonde. <laughs> and, uh, and so the other night, um, I was in Dallas. I was going uh, on to, uh, to California, and I was in the Dallas Fort Worth Airport, and I was just walking down the, at the corridor. And this lovely little old lady, um, she was, I think, maybe in her 70s, she, she just ran up to me. Well, it's true, 70 is the new 50, right? But, uh, anyway, so, uh, she just ran up to me and she threw her arms around me. It's always, it's always um, the women that age who are throwing their arms around me. And she said that. <laughs> and I love it, I love it. That's, and she said to me, she said, that, are you the one? She was so excited, it was so endearing. She said, are you the one that I see on Fox News all the time? And I said, well, ma'am, I think I am. Do you watch Fox News a lot? And she said to me, she said, do I watch Fox News a lot? She said, I don't even know how to change the channel on my TV. <laughs> That's the way a lot of us are, right? That, uh, we only need one station at night. Um, I appreciate the nice introduction, Glenn. I need to um, correct you on something that you said about me. It, it is true that they asked me if I wanted the um, the scanner or the full pat down. Um, it is true, and it is true that I chose the full pat down. But it wasn't Janet Napolitano. It was Christine Brinkley who did it. <laughs> That was a lot of fun. Um, you know, uh, I want to talk a little bit about election. Before I do, though, I want to just tell you one fun story about the journal, because I, I really enjoyed working there. And, and Bob, thanks so much for the, the kind words. I do think the journal is the kind of voice of the conservative movement around the country. And, and we have good news there, by the way. The journal is not now, in terms of our, uh, you know, when you talk about print media, print media is, is going out of business, right? I mean, print, print media, if you look at the five major newspapers in the country, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, New York Times, uh, USA Today, and LA Times, only one of those papers has an increase in circulation. Anybody want to take a guess at what paper that is? The Wall Street Journal. And I, I come bearing some really good news to you this afternoon, which is that the New York Times is about this close to federal bankruptcy. And could it I gotta just tell you kind of one fun story about working at the journal. It has nothing to do with politics or the economy, but it's the most fun I've had here since I started five years ago, which is that uh, we do these long interviews every Saturday in our paper with some famous person. And I've done John McCain, and I've done Fred Smith of Federal Express, and Charles Schwab, and all these really interesting people. But the most interesting person I ever met in my life uh, I interviewed about seven months ago, uh, and it's got a guy by the name of Art Linkletter. How many of you remember Art Linkletter? Now, Art Linkletter was just a legend, right? I mean, I asked him, how big were you, Art? And he said, I was 
Steve, he's like, Steve, I was Oprah before there was Oprah. Uh, just a really sweet guy. Not, he was, by the way, he tra it just di died about four months ago. So I was really proud to do one of the last um, you know, interviews with him before he died. He was just a treasure chest of, of fun stories. I mean, he knew everybody in the golden age of Hollywood. He knew, you know, Ronald, Nancy Reagan. He knew um, Jack Benny. He knew Groucho Marx. He knew Walt Disney. All these people. It was filled with fun stories. And uh, you all remember, by the way, you remember his famous TV show that he had, Kids Say the Darnest Things, where yeah, yeah. he'd bring up young kids to the to the stage and they'd say, you know, the darndest things. And, and so I couldn't help asking him. And, you know, I said, so, uh, um, I said, uh, Howard, what's your favorite story in doing the, uh, you know, the, that segment on, on, the, on the CBS uh, show? He said, well, he said one time he brought up the six-year-old boy and he's, the camera's rolling. This little boy just has tears streaming down his cheeks. And, and he says to the little boy, says, son, you know, what's wrong? Why are you so sad? And the little boy says, well, Mr. Linkletter, my dog just died. And so uh, Art consolingly puts his arm around him and says to him, you know, son, I just want you to know you shouldn't feel so sad about your dog dying. And, you know, this is, uh, I just want to assure you something, son, that your dog is now up in heaven with God. And so the little boy turns to Art Linkletter and says, well, Mr. Linkletter, what would God want with a dead dog? <laughs> conservative, by the way. Buffalo free market, you know, he was, he was in favor of social security privatization and getting rid of the death tax and all the things that we care so much about. So that was a lot of fun. Um, all right, on the election, I, I said this last night, but I'll say it again. I haven't been able to stop smiling for the last two weeks. I mean, was that a great election? Or, yeah, it was you know, I, I told this story last night, but I called my mom in Chicago, and I said, Mom, it's a great night, you know, here on the East Coast, you know, it's over at Fox News at about 10 o'clock, I called her, she, I said, looks like it's going to be a clean sweep in the East for the Republicans, and she said, yeah, uh, she said, Steve, uh, here in Chicago, it's such a good night for Republicans, even the dead people are voting Republican. <laughs> but um, it was a great night for Republicans, but one of the points I'd make, Bob, that I think is so important for us as conservatives to emphasize is that this wasn't a victory for Republicans, right? It wasn't a victory. It was a victory for the conservative free market movement. And it was a repudiation, and we made this case uh, for months and months, that we, this was an important election because it was a repudiation of all the crap ideas that we've seen in the past Congress over the last two years. And I've been involved in public policy now for almost 30 years. I moved to Washington right out of college. And I have never seen the kind of damage that we've done to our economy that we've seen in the last two years. And it's frightening. And, and I would make the case to you that now more than ever, it is so important to become involved both in terms of your time, your energy, and your money with groups like James Madison Institute. Because we are now at a kind of turning point uh, and a crossroads with our economy. Are we going to continue to move in this bankrupting and bankrupt socialist model that we're that uh, is so much um so prevalent now in washington or are we going to do what works and we know it works and, and and these ideas of freedom and free markets and lower taxes are not brain surgery i mean i don't even have to talk to you all and persuade you that you know let limited government and less taxes and less regulation are the things that make economies grow. And Ronald Reagan taught us that, right, 25 years ago. When he cut the taxes, we had one of the greatest economic booms in our country's history. You should have gone down the CNN mm -hmm. show for me, because you're right that when Reagan cut taxes, you all remember this, when we brought the tax rate down from 70 to 28 percent, we didn't see tax revenues decline. We saw tax revenues double, because the economy grew. And, and so the point I'm making is these ideas are pr pretty commonsensical everywhere except in Washington. And sometimes, unfortunately, in state capitals, which is why what groups like uh, Mackinac Center or James Madison Institute do are so important. Because the truth is, in Washington and Tallahassee and in Lansing, we're outnumbered, right? They have all the forces because the, the left is mostly funded by government. That's one thing a lot of people don't realize. Where do you think the unions get all this money to spend on a get out the vote and, and all the $100 million of ads they wrap? They don't, they don't get that mostly from dues. They get some of it from dues, but mostly they get it from government programs. And so when we spend $800 billion on that 
the stimulus bill, guess what? A lot of that money went straight to the unions, so the unions could use it to elect more Democrats. And, and so we are outgunned. Uh, the way I put it is, you know, you just take some of these piddly programs in Washington, like the Legal Services Corporation, that's a $200 million program. That one little single piddly program which funds left-wing lawyers, that's like three heritage foundations. Um, and so it's actually a kind of amazing that we win as many battles as we do. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the priorities that I see uh, for, our, for our country in terms of what we have to do over the next couple of years to get this economy going. Uh, and, and I'll start with the most important thing. Uh, if this election was about anything, <laughs> and I was probably, I've probably visited 35 states in the last seven months, so I've been all over the country, and I, I visit a lot of these congressional districts where we, we had you know, really hotly contested races. And there was one theme that just came shouting through at every race. Uh, and it was a three-word theme. Stop the spending, right? That's what it was all about. Stop this insane spending. And that's the message, hopefully, that these members of Congress got. I know Connie Mack believes in these ideas. By the way, I, I, you should be so proud of your congressman from this area, Connie Mack, because he is really a superstar for, for these ideas. But just to give you a sense of how completely out of control these things are. Over the last two years, if you count all of the spending that we have done, uh, and, and by the way, I'm not making a partisan point here, because a lot of this started under George W. Bush, remember in his last months in office. We did the $700 billion bailout of the banks, and then we did the $800 billion stimulus bill, and then we did the Cash for Plunkers program, remember that one that, that where we gave money to, to uh, for people to destroy their cars. And then we did, uh, you know, uh, by the way, I have to say, it sounds great. You know, Joe Biden, a couple weeks ago, uh, was on TV, and he said that, uh, he said that um, the fiscal stimulus plan has worked beyond his wildest dreams. I'm not making this up. And yeah, the next day in the Washington Post, they had a great cartoon with, uh, with um, uh, President Obama carrying around Joe Biden like as a piece of lumber. Uh, and, it said, uh, and he went up to this window and it said, cash for clunkers. And, uh, that's sort of great. Uh, but but, but anyway, you should add up all the costs of these programs. And, you know, another one, uh, Glenn, you mentioned uh, that I was on TV today with CNN that'll air this weekend. And you saw me, I had smoke coming out of your ears when I came back from that. Because all of these liberal economists on the show were arguing, if we extend unemployment insurance and then tax the rich, we're gonna get more jobs. Now wait a minute. So what they're saying is we take money away from people who produce jobs, we give it to money to people who aren't working, we're gonna create jobs. I mean, is this nuttiness or what? I mean, maybe I'm just on a different planet or something like that, but I don't understand the logic of that idea at all. And so, um, if you add up all this cost, just to give you a sense of the wrongness of what we have done, uh, with two trillion dollars, the cost of all these programs, we could have suspended the personal income tax for two years. You know, we could have made the United States government like Florida, right? No income tax. Now, can you imagine how much our economy would have grown if, if George Bush two years ago had said, you know what, until we're out of this crisis and we're back to a 6% unemployment rate, we're not gonna impose an income tax on any worker or any employer in this country? I mean, we, that would be like rocket fuel for this economy, right? And instead, so the tragedy to me is that we spent the $2 trillion, it's that we spent the $2 trillion and we didn't get anything for it, except for increases amounts of debt. And I always say that the reason that people aren't even angrier is that the money that we spent is so big that it's almost become incomprehensible. Um, the, the, you know, there's a saying in Washington now that a trillion is the new billion. And it, it's true, we did start talking about trillions. I've been in this town for 25 years, I don't remember when we started talking about the budget and the trillions of dollars. Um, 12 zeros in a trillion. A trillion uh, dollars is a million, million dollars. And we talked about this last night, but I always tell my, uh, when I go to bed, uh, when I'm at home, and I, I have three kids, two teenagers who I'm not too fond of, but I have a <laughs> <laughs> So um, I said to my mother, I said, David, you know, um, I thought one night I would tell him, a, a, you know, a, a, a scary story, so I thought I'd tell him something about the national debt, right? Because, you know, this, after all, he's going to have to pay for this. And so I said, hey, David, do you know how much a trillion dollars is? And he said, uh, uh, no. And I said, well, the one thing he does know a lot about is the uh, is the NBA. And, and so I said, well, David, who's the greatest basketball player in the world? And he said, LeBron James. So I said, uh, David, how much money does David LeBron James make? And he knew this because he's a big, he knew that he makes $40 million a year, or $25 million in salary, and another $15 million in endorsements. And that's a pretty good salary. So I posed this question to my son David, I'll pose the same one to you. How many seasons do you think LeBron James would have to play basketball at $40 million a year to have a trillion dollars? The answer is 40, uh, 25,000 seasons. 
<laughs> so this is this is the kind of money that we're spending. At one of these um, uh, Tea Party rallies that I went to, there was a wonderful, uh, this guy had a little three-year-old in, in, in her stroller, and she had this wonderful sign around her neck, and it said, do I look like I have $4 trillion? <laughs> and I just thought that, that, solid, that really summarized the problem. But just to put one more, uh, uh, just to punctuate this point one more time, um, if you look at the budget that Nancy Pelosi proposed uh, six months ago, by the way, isn't it wonderful news that Nancy Pelosi is no longer the Speaker of the House? Uh, her last budget, she proposed a budget that would borrow $10 trillion over the next 10 years. $10 trillion. Now, that's more money than the United States government borrowed from 1776 through 2005. And that was a period, you know, when we had fought the Civil War, the Revolutionary War, World War I, World War II. I mean, these are insane numbers. And, and this is, you know, you've, many of you heard me say this before, this is, this is fiscal child abuse that we, what we've seen over the last, uh, you know, we're all old enough in this room that we're not going to probably have to pay the cost of this. But our children and our grandchildren and our grandchildren's children are going to pay for this fiscal insanity. And so it's such good news that Americans finally said, stop. Stop the spending. This is this is out of control. We're borrowing forty cents now for every dollar we spend in Washington. Now, I wanted to walk with, through you the the illogic of this idea that government spending creates jobs, because that was the basis, right, for this eight hundred billion dollars spending plan. That well, the government would spend this eight hundred billion dollars, and it would circulate throughout the economy, right, and and this would get employers hiring again, and we create. Remember, Barack Obama said we create three million jobs and we hold the unemployment rate to less than 8% if we spent all this money. Well, you all know what happened. We did spend the $800 billion. We didn't create 3 million jobs. We actually lost almost 3 million jobs over that period. The unemployment rate didn't fall to below 8%. We're at near 10%. So, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious that it's a failure. And the question then becomes, why did it fail? Why do people still believe in this absurd superstition that government spending creates jobs. And I think the answer was summarized by Joe and I, my favorite economist in the world, um, uh, Milton Friedman. Right? And what Milton Friedman taught us was a very simple, he taught us a lot, but I always say that the you know, most important insight that Milton Friedman taught us, um, maybe the most important insight of all economics, it all comes down to this. There's no such thing as a free lunch, right? If, if, if the government spends a dollar, the dollar has to come from someone. That's pretty obvious. Isn't it? I could say this in this room because I don't think there are any kids in here, but there's no tooth fairy, right? There's no tooth fairy out there passing out free dollars. And so when you think about it, let, let's kind of walk through the logic of this. So if the government's going to spend $800 billion, there's, there's three ways they can get money to spend it. What's the first way it can get money? It can tax it, right? You can literally, quite literally, reach into my wallet, it can take out this $20 bill, and it can give it to what? Thank right? you very much. Okay. <laughs> so, so I will want that money back. <laughs> so, so, so think about this transaction now. Um, they taxed me for twenty dollars. They gave the money to Glenn. Now Glenn's a happy camper, right? He's going to go out to McDonald's, or he's going to go to Walmart, or he's going to get his nails done, or whatever he does. You know? <laughs> and he's going to spend that money, and that's going to reverberate throughout the economy. This is called the. This is what Keynesians call the um, multiplier effect, and it's true that if, if Glenn goes out and spends it, and you know that means the McDonald's workers can have money, and he can go spend it, and so on. And so it, you know, the people say, look, that twenty dollars is going to lead to sixty dollars of economic activity, a three times multiplier effect. And there's truth to that, except what if they left out of the equation? What they left out of the equation is, Glenn is $20 richer, but I'm $20 poor. Right? There's no, there's no uh, stimulus to the economy from this transaction, right? In fact, at best, it's zero, right, the effect of this. But I'd make the case it's not zero. This is a negative sum game. It's not a zero sum game. It's a negative sum game. Cause, why? Because I worked to get the money, and Glenn stole it from me, right? And that's not the way you create wealth. And by the way, Glenn, I will want that from you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what's the second way they can get the money? Borrow. They can borrow it, right? And this is what we've just been talking about. They have borrowed just in the last two years $3 trillion. Now then the question becomes, does that add to, does that stimulate the economy when the government borrows money and then spends it? Well, the spending, for the same reason we just talked about, does create stimulus, but guess what? Somebody has to buy the bonds, right? That's what they leave out of the equation, that to, to, to borrow and spend uh, $3 trillion. That means Americans and people around the world had to buy $3 trillion of the bonds so the government had it, right? So you're not put, can you see you're not injecting any additional money into the economy because you're taking out just as much as you're putting in. 
Um, and what's the third way they can get money? They can print it. And that's, that, that's what I wanted to spend a minute talking about because have you all been following this whole debate of what they call QE2? Yeah. Uh, yes. uh, and this is a fancy, QE2 is not just shit that goes across the, you know, this is Queen Elizabeth II. This is, this is a program, it's a, QE2 is a fancy term for basically saying what the federal government is doing right now, the Federal Reserve Bank is simply printing money, right? It's printing six hundred billion dollars and with that what's it doing with the six hundred billion dollars it's purchasing the debt with the six hundred billion dollars this is what we call monetizing the debt this is you said it very well yesterday Glad. this is what banana republics do right this is the Argentina Bolivia Mexico model of economic development right they print money every time they get into a debt crisis and, and that's where we're headed if we allow this to happen. Now, I, I know everyone in the room knows the answer to this question, but if the federal government continues to just print money, what is the effect of that? Inflation, right? I mean, it's almost like saying, if everybody could magically, I could take this $20 bill, and I could magically put an extra zero on it, and you could put an extra zero on your 10 and one and five, so a five is now worth 50 and a 20 is worth 200, would we all be richer? No. I mean, obviously not. Somebody accept me the Zimbabwe currency. It's like one thousand trillion, you know, dollars for thirty-two cents, right? So you don't get uh, you don't get rich by printing money. And the way my my friend Larry Kudlow says this so um, cogently, uh, and, and it's uh, I always borrow this phrase from him: the federal government and the Federal Reserve Bank can print money, but they can't print jobs. And, and that's, I think, what's left out of this equation. So we do have to stop the spending. We've got to stop the, 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 the kind of swamp in Washington where we just spend money on these crazy uh, programs. Uh, the second issue I wanted to bring up, which is the flip side of this, is to me the most important issue for the next few weeks and the next few months is what is going to happen with the Bush tax cuts, right? And how are we going to uh, defuse this tax bomb that's supposed to uh, detonate on January 1st. How many of you are following this issue, by the way? Because this is a really big one. And, and we were talking about this this morning on CNN. I really, I think the economy is in an expansion right now. Finally, we're starting to see some job pick up and some GDP pick up and business activity picking up. But you know what? I, as I look at the numbers, if we allow this tax bomb to detonate on January 1st, I think it will cause a double dip recession. I, I, I don't think the U.S. economy, as fragile as this recovery is right now, it can handle the weight of a, of a new massive tax increase. Now, if Tim Geithner were here, or Larry Summers, or you know all these other economists that Obama has, what they say is, look, you know, we, we can do this. The economy expanded when we had rates like this in the 1990s, and we can do it again. And this, what else do they say? Well, this is only rich people, right? This is only the top two or three percent that are going to pay these taxes. A um, couple things on that. Well, first of all, let's talk about what taxes are going up, because this is really important. What The first one that's going up is the capital gains tax, right? So the, currently the capital gains tax is 15, it's going up to 20%. And then I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but in that god-awful health care bill that we passed just nine months ago, one of the ways they, quote, pay for it is with a 3.8% investment tax surcharge. Uh, anybody aware of that, that that's in that bill? That's a big deal. So it means we're not going from 15 to 20. We're going from 15 to 20 to 23.8% on capital gains. That, folks, that's a 60% increase in the capital gains tax. Now, what is the capital gains tax? The capital gains tax is simply a tax on owning an asset, right? So can you think of a, a worse time to be increasing taxes on assets now at a time when we have deflation and values of real estate and what's happened with the stock market and so on? I mean, what you're going to do if you if you raise those taxes up is what's going to happen to the stock market if you increase the capital gains tax by 60 percent? What's going to happen to stock value? They're going to fall, right? I mean, one easy way to think about this: think about if these nuts in Washington said, you know, the way we're going to balance our budget, we're going to have 100 percent capital gains tax, right? I mean, I wouldn't put it past these people. Uh, they just don't have their trade tables in the upright and locked position when it comes to this. <laughs> so, think about what would what would happen to the value of stocks if you had 100 percent capital gains tax? Stocks would fall to zero, right? The only reason we own stocks is they have an after tax return. If the government takes the entire after tax return, uh, then you're not going to have any value of these things. So that's a really dangerous thing to do. The second one, what's the second tax that goes out? The dividend tax. The dividend tax doesn't just go from 15 to 20. Dividends go from 15 all the way to 39, uh, to, to uh, just about 40%. That's almost a tripling of the tax on dividends. And by the way, that 3.8 
the, that 3.8% investment surtax, that applies to dividend income as well. So we're talking about 15 to about 44% on dividends. Um, that would be a catastrophically bad decision to be making. It would reduce the value of stocks. It would, you know, the other thing that would happen is if you triple the, the uh, tax on dividends, what do you think companies are going to do? They're going to stop paying dividends, right? They're going to stop putting the money in the hands of the, of the shareholders through, through the retained earnings. And we saw this, by the way, in 2003 when I was part of the team. I don't think I told you this, one, but in January 2003, remember when George Bush wanted to stimulate the economy? He said, you know, he had a team of economists, and it was uh, Steve Forbes and Larry Kudlow and Art Laffer and myself and about four or five others. And we went to the White House and we said, Mr. President, if you want to stimulate the economy, the way to do that is to cut the dividend tax because then you're going to be, you know, the dividend tax is just a double tax on corporate income, right? We tax it at the corporate level and then we tax it when it's passed on to the shareholders. And the president saw that. This is the way to get the, you know, to, the to get companies to invest, was to cut the dividend tax. And by the way, that happened. If you look at what happened to dividend payments, in the in the uh, in the first two years after we cut the dividend tax down to 15 percent, uh, we saw a doubling in dividend payments by major American corporations. My favorite example is Microsoft. Microsoft had never made a dividend payment to its shareholders in the history of that company, and in 2000, late 2004, it made an eight billion dollar dividend payment, the largest dividend payment of any American company in history. And when Steve Ballmer was asked about why he did it, he said, "We're doing this because the dividend tax is lower." So. If we do this, we're going to probably see a real reduction in dividend payments. And then the, the third one that goes up is, is the personal income tax rate. That goes from 35 to 41 um, percent. That's that's a disaster. We're in a competitive world right now. And and the reason this is such an insidious policy is because guess who pay guess what group of people are going to pay that higher income tax rate? Small business owners, operators, and investors. Guess who pay, Guess who, who creates 70% of the jobs in the U.S. economy today? Small businesses do. So, wait a minute, we're going to put higher taxes. I always ask Robert Reich, because I, I debate him on uh, Cudlow's show a couple times a week. You know, he's about this time. He was in the, uh, he was in the uh, Obama cabinet. And, you know, he's always talking about jobs. He was the labor secretary, for goodness sakes. And all he talks about is we need more jobs. And I agree with him. God, we need millions more jobs. And I would say to Bob, 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 how are you going to create more jobs if you're going to tax the people that create the jobs? You know, I mean, Art Lapper says this best, right? If you tax something, you get less of it. If you tax something less, you get more of it. Why do we want to put taxes, higher taxes on small businesses on their employment because it's going to lead to less of it? So that's a really dangerous thing. One last statistic on this stuff, and I know I'm, I know you guys all know this because you're smart people and you read the Wall Street Journal editorial page, but we talk about this almost every other day. The richest 1% in America today, well, let me start, the richest 10%, the richest one out of 10 Americans, you know what percentage of the uh, income tax they pay now? 72%. 72% is paid by the top 10%, the top 5% pay 60%, and the top one out of 100 pay 40% of the income tax. By the way, the top 50%, anyone with income above the median in the United States today, anybody want to guess what percentage of income tax they pay? 97.3%. So the, all Americans with an income below the median, they only pay two, about 2.5% two of the income tax in this country today. So this is a highly progressive tax structure we have now. And the point of all of this is if we want to get this mal budget balanced, what we need is more rich people, right? I, I'm with Larry Kudlow. I love rich people. <laughs> you know, they're the people that create jobs and pay the bills for the government. Um, the the uh, other issue I wanted to bring up um, is the other mandate that I think Republicans have. Uh, that is maybe even more important than, than this tax cut is we have got to repeal Obamacare. Can we all agree on that? Obamacare. Uh, this is going to be an interesting one to see how this works out. I, I think Obamacare may be the worst single bill that we pass out of Congress in 50 years. It's, it's already causing exploding costs, right, in terms of people's insurance premiums and what's happening with people's, uh, you know, businesses now having to drop their insurance plans. Um, this is a this is a big deal. I, I was giving a talk, um, Bob, in uh, Dallas um, not too long ago, and to the NFIB, which is the biggest organization of small businesses. And this gentleman came up to me after my speech, and he said, "Look, I own 50 Mexican restaurants in the Dallas Fort Worth area." He said, "I employ 2,000 workers at my so he's you know an important um, you know small business man and important important hire of workers in that area." And he said, "Obamacare." By my calculations, he said, is going to cost them $1,100 a year per employee. Per employee. So 
what does that mean? That means that cost him two million dollars, that single bill. Two million dollars, that's, you know, they both have about 50 employees that he can't hire now because of this law. And you multiply that across the economy and you can see what's wrong with, with Obamacare. Now, I think what we ought to do, and one of the outrages, I have to tell you this, and for those of you who watch uh, Greta, did you notice how she'd always have the health care bill on her desk and it was uh, grown bigger and bigger? It was, I think it wasn't the final one, like 2,800 pages. And I actually, was one of the few people in America, Black, that actually read that bill. I, I mean, you want insomnia, just read that bill over three nights. And, and so um, when I got to the end of it, one of the most amazing things about that bill, anybody want to take a guess at how many pages of that bill dealt, dealt with the issue of medical malpractice reform? Zero. Zero. Not one single page dealt with one of the easiest ways to reduce healthcare costs, which is to take out the huge uh, sort of tax that we pay be with the trial lawyers. And, and that was not dealt with, nor was the issue of one of the ways that I think you know, I'd love to see the state think tanks get together and work on um, is to allow, it just, in fact, I hope Connie Mack should introduce this bill in the new Congress. You want to see healthcare costs fall dramatically? Just simply allow any insurance company to purchase to sell insurance in any uh, any state. Right? Interstate. I'm serious because I would love to see that be the first or second or third bill passed by this new Congress to say, look, you know, I mean, because if you look at across states, I think. Are you a high cost state or low cost state in terms of health care? Um, uh, I'm not familiar with Florida, but I know states like Michigan is a pretty high tax, uh, high cost state. I mean, my favorite example is you look at compare New Hampshire with Massachusetts. You can buy an insurance policy in New Hampshire for about eight thousand dollars a year, but that same policy in Massachusetts costs about sixteen thousand dollars. Well, why is that? Because Massachusetts has all of these mandates and so on. So if you want to get people in Massachusetts, you want to bring down the number of people who can't have insurance, can't afford insurance in Massachusetts, let them buy a New Hampshire policy, right? And so we could dramatically reduce the cost of this. The other thing we've got to do in healthcare, and I know groups like uh, Mackinac and Cato Institute and JMI have led the way on this, is through medical savings accounts. And health savings, how many of you in this room have an MSA or a health savings account? I mean, I have one myself. These are great ways to reduce costs by basically having high deductibles, bringing the patient back into the equation. And the reason this is such a crucial battle, I think when I talk about crossroads, we are, right, Joe, right, jo, and about, we're at crossroads on healthcare right now. And we're gonna go in one of two directions. Because Obamacare within, I would guess, 24 months is gonna explode. Even if Republicans don't repeal it, the costs are going to spiral out of control. We're going to have to fix this again. And then the question becomes this. Do we move towards a, health, a free market, consumer-driven model of health care, or do we have the single-payer model? And that's what Obama and Nancy Pelosi want, right? And that's why I hope that you all will devote your resources to this issue, because it's a crucial one. Last one I want to bring up, I, just because I, it's one that it just sticks in my craw. Um, and I'll say, I don't want to be quoted on this publicly, but I'm just going to say this to you. Um, I think global warming is the greatest hoax of the last hundred years. Yeah. And so many states, like Florida, and like Michigan, and in my home state of Illinois, and all these states, they're talking about passing cap-and-trade bills in their state legislature. I, I, I know I saw some uh, Democrat in, in uh, Michigan uh, propose that bill. This is craziness, right? You know, what I call the cap and trade bill, I call that bill the China and India Full Employment Act, right? Yeah. Because all we are going to do if we pass this massive tax on ourselves, it's a massive energy tax on our manufacturers, our industries, uh, all of our companies would have to pay more. Well, what does that mean? It means, guess what? Those jobs and those companies are gonna leave the United States and they're gonna go somewhere else. Just like if you were to pass cap and trade in Florida, you wouldn't be reducing carbon emissions, even if, I mean, look, I know some of you think that uh, global warming is a problem. A lot of people are respect do. But even if you believe that, there's no, there's no reduction in carbon emissions by a state or even the U.S. government, you know, restricting our own carbon emissions because you're just moving those uh, plants out of the state. And by the way, do you know what state, what state does have cap and trade now? California. 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 I mean, can we do something? About, uh, we were just joking. Maybe what we need to do if we want to, 
you know, invade communist, you know, communist countries, we should invade California. Right? <laughs> they did not from the crazy people. They re-elected Governor Moonbeam. I mean, these people are nuts or what? Uh, and so this is a big problem, by the way, for the U.S. economy, because California is exactly the model of what not to do, and Florida is exactly the model of what to do, right? And that, that's why what you do is so important, Bob. I'm, I'm serious about this. You have to be a shining example for the rest of the country under this new regime with what? You've got two-thirds Republican control of the now of the legislature. You've got an innovative, young, dynamic new governor. I mean, you can make the state the showcase for the rest of the country. And, and I'm really, can we all agree on one thing, by the way? No bailout for California. No bailout. <laughs> Before this year is out, I mean, before 2011 is out, California's going to come with their tin cup and hand to watch yep. saying, give us $50 billion to yep. pay our bills because we can't pay our bills because we've got all these crazy liberal um, ideas. It really is the uh, the uh, state of fruits and nuts. Um, and so uh, that's that's an important thing for us to be thinking about, too. Um, I'm optimistic. This is the last point I'll make. I really am optimistic because I think I'm so excited the American people rose up in such a thunderous way to say, stop what you're doing in Washington. I, I was afraid that people weren't paying attention. They were being sucked into this idea that all this government spending and this debt was going to cause some kind of economic recovery. It hasn't. But you know what? If we get these policies right, if we get the spending down, and we get the debt down, and we extend these tax cuts, and then the other thing I think I'm a big believer we need to do, I just think we need to pass a flat tax in this country, yeah. as, you know, yeah. flat 18% tax. If we did that, we would see so much growth in this country. And remember, Steve Forbes talked about this, what, 15, 20 years ago. The time is right for this, because we are living in a world now where there is global competition, right? Where we're competing with everyone. And uh, maybe I'll stop with this one last story, which is, I think, really the most important one of all. And some of you have heard me tell this before, but I, I just think it's so critically important which is that the real issue, well, the reason we're all here is because we care about our kids, really. And, and the number one issue for our country that we have to be thinking about is over the next 5 and 10 and 20, 30 years, what country is going to be the superpower?